So, the Transformers movies, either you like them, you hate them, or you fall somewhere in between, just like me, in which you can recognize their flaws, their many, 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 many flaws, but are still able to get some enjoyment from it. In this video, I'll be talking about all the errors that we can see in Revenge of the Fallen. Well, I say all, but I might miss some, just like how in last video, some people told me about some errors that I missed. And yes, listen, once I'm done covering the movies, I go back and probably do a part 2 for all the extra errors I missed, because there's more out there. And frankly, I don't want this to be a half an hour long video, so if I cut some errors, I'm sorry about that. But for the most part, I'll go over all the important slash notable ones. My last video got copyright striking by Paramount because I guess they didn't like me talking about errors. So I re-edited that video and uploaded it once again. So if you guys haven't seen that video or if you've seen it when it first got released, then chances are your comment probably got deleted too. So if you haven't watched it or if you left a comment, it probably got deleted. If you could go back <laughs> and like hit me up with a like all over again, that would be much appreciated. Like, you know, making these videos take me a long time to do and like are pretty hard. So... Any support you can give me is like very much appreciated. But enough of that. Today we're gonna be taking a look at Revenge of the Fallen, which I think has a bunch more errors than the first movie. Cause Revenge of the Fallen was a pretty messy film, you know? Just wait until we get to the last night. The last night is gonna be a probably a two-part episode. <laughs> Cause that movie the movie itself's an error. But we're not here to talk about the future, right now we're just going to be talking about the present. Well, I guess the past in this point. We're going to be taking a look at Revenge of the Fallen, I'll be talking about the errors in CGI models, scenery, environment, and some continuity errors, which here's where they start taking a foothold in the franchise. If there's any errors I miss, feel free to tell me in the comments down below, and after this video, you won't be able to unsee some of these errors. You might as well say they are errors in disguise. But anyways, enough joking around, let's begin now. In the opening scene of the movie, when the Fallen lands to inspect the tribal humans, he lifts up his right foot to stomp on them. However, when the scene switches to an overhead view, it is suddenly his left foot that stomps. So, I mean, that could have been a camera per perspective thing, but no, no, it's, it's very clearly the wrong foot. Oops. What a good way to start this movie! During uh, the Shanghai scene where the twins and the RC sisters are, you know, pursuing sideways, when the twins crash and had a little, you know, argument where they, you know, fight with one another, um, their voices are switched. No, seriously, I did not notice that until the DF Wiki told me. <laughs> Tom Kenny's voice is coming from Mudflap as he announces he's okay, while Reno Wilson's voice comes from Skits as, he, as he's punching Mudflap. So the two of them switch voice actors, which I guess originally Mudflap was the one that was going to be punching Skits and not the other way around, so that's why that line was kept. But I like to think that the twins are so brain damaged that they started speaking with each other's voices. Who knows? During the Shanghai battle, when the ramp on the Nest C-17 transport is lowering to reveal Optimus Prime in the cargo bay, you can actually see Michael Bay in the background. If you look at the left side of the screen, there he is everyone, everyone's favorite director. Please clap. Oh god. Okay, to be fair, I did not notice that for the longest time because who's looking at the background? But, you know, when you go out of your way to look for stuff in the background during these videos, yeah, I, I can never look at that scene the same way again. The vehicle modes that the twins scan already have personalized license plates on them. Though, this could theoretically just be the NES personnel customizing the cars for the twins since they seem to do that for all of the other one cars but something interesting about license plates and yeah i know license plates are going to become a recurring theme throughout the series um despite sporting a skids old capital license plate in vehicle mode most of the time a skid sports a license plate in his vehicle model which says beat and this can be seen in an establishing shot during the scene in new york city and also one more thing if the twins have personalized, you know, um, cars with license plates that say the names, why are they fighting over what car they get to use? Is the car they're gonna get to use, it's just gonna have their brother's name on it. Ugh. Yeah, that's very, that's kind of weird, actually. That's very, that's very weird. So, in which the Fallen Bone will be got a new Camaro vehicle mode, you know, different car and all. But 
but won't be still sports the same license plate as in the previous film. Now that wouldn't be such a bad thing, but his license plate is still inconsistent between his vehicle mode and his robot mode. It alternates between 900 STR in vehicle mode and 4NCC454 in robot mode. Also, let's keep talking about license plates for a bit because I don't know what the deal with these are that the production keeps you know, making silly errors with them, but Ironhide has the license plate from the previous movie on his chest or his robot mode. You know, makes sense, but when we see his vehicle mode, he has no license plate. So where did that license plate come from? Hmm, maybe the license plates are magic. Also, um, I'm not sure if this counts as an error, but I know some people would count as an error, but when Sam jumps from the second story of his house to escape the kitchen bots, you can see that that's obviously not Shia LaBeouf who does the stunt, it's a stunt person, who doesn't look much like him. Honestly, that's one of those blink you miss moments, but it's a thing that regularly happens in Hollywood with actors that don't do their own stunts. I don't, I don't think it's much of an error, just like a little thing that's necessary for the movie, but I can see what people will count it. Also, um, during the scene when the Ness is having that briefing, with the US military, Optimus Prime is missing the cyberglyphic on his cheek during the scene in the hangar. But speaking of magic, during that pointless party scene where Alice is hitting on Sam, Sam's drink at first is seen as full, but then when the camera angle changes, the glass is half full slash empty, then the angle changes again and the glass is full again. So again, my theory that Sam could probably be magic might be real. Okay, back to geography errors. Bumblebee picks up Sam at the frat party in the evening. He then takes him to a graveyard where it's dawn. In real life, the graveyard is located in Philadelphia, while the frat party is set a hundred miles north in Princeton. Still, even in New Jersey traffic, the trip wouldn't take all night. During Sam's campus freakout when he drops all those papers, a blonde woman in a suit can be seen coming down the steps to his left, nearly reaching him. However, when the camera angle shifts, that woman is back at the top again. Huh, woman am I right? Actually, I probably shouldn't make that joke, that might offend some people. Cut that out. When Alice attacks Sam in that very uncomfortable awkward scene I don't want Michael Bay to replicate ever again, part of the window behind them is taken out by a fan. Hmm. When Michaela throws the toolbox, it's smashed through a glass pane where the fan had been moments before, with the fan itself now resting against the wall under the Bad Boys 2 poster. Listen guys, I play FNAF, I think that fan might be magic. When the Autobots are driving to Sam's college during the Decepticon attack, RC is completely absent from the group, which, you know, Ness says that all the Autobots are there, but the RC sisters are completely missing. And while in the early shot he wasn't seen, Jolt later shows up in front of the others as if he was ahead of them the entire time. Then when the camera angle changes, he disappears once again. It's a very inconsistent scene with all the Autobots just disappearing, but the biggest sin was that RC was not there. In the flyover shot of the barge on which the four constructed cons sit, a red bulldozer, a concrete mixer, a green dump truck, and a yellow front end loader are visible. After the flyover shot, the four constructed cons are now a yellow bulldozer in place of the red one, a concrete mixer, a green dump truck, and a yellow bulbo excavator in place of the yellow front end loader. Now this is one that I always think about, but when Megatron gets revived, you know, we saw five Constructicons going down there to revive him, you know? And we know that the little one gets killed. So um, when Megatron gets revived and the Decepticons are going back to the surface, we see that the submarine crew is saying that there's now six contacts going towards them. But technically there should only be five because you know Megatron was dead, then he revived, and the little one was killed. So Megatron took the little one's spot. And I definitely do feel that Ravage and the Doctor are too small for the radar to notice. When the USSS Theodore Roosevelt is sunk by the Subtacon protoforms, its whole number of 71 can be seen on the bridge island. However, when it sinks, a whole number of 74 can clearly be seen on the bow of the landing deck. CVN-74 belongs to the USSS John C. Stennis, a carrier that shows up later in the film and was also the carrier used for the filming. Does no one stay dead in these movies? Also, one more thing, tasers don't cause you to go into convulsions, that, uh, that's not how tasers work, even if you get tased in the nuts. When the Nest team is heading to Egypt aboard the airplanes, Prime's body appears and disappears from shot to shot. Kinda like how Bonnie did in the first movie. When an aide to General Morshower shows him a map indicating that Lagnus' Nest team have airdropped in Egypt, 
the location marked is actually on the eastern side of the Red Sea in Jordan, not exactly near Egypt. Oops. Like I probably got fire. <laughs> now this is one of those, you know, um, you need to slow down to, to truly know this, but when Bumblebee's kids and Mothlub are being attacked by Starscream, you can see Bumblebee's prop car door flailing open when Starscream fires a missile from the ground. When I first saw that, I thought Bumblebee was about to transform and try to fight Starscream from the ground. Instead, they just ran away in vehicle mode and the fight was barely a fight. In the query when Devastator forms, the twins go from grimy and dust cover to showroom floor clean within two shots. Which, you know, it's very weird cause Devastator wasn't sucking them yet. When Sam and Michaela are running at the same moment Megatron spots them, you can see Sam is holding Michaela's arm, but his jacket is nowhere to be seen. In the next shot, he has his jacket on his arm. Again, the disappearing jacket here from the first movie's back, though in different form. And keeping up with the references to the first video I made, which you should totally check out after this video is over. The NK-1 Predator drone that the military uses is actually an NQ-9 Reaper. The drone is powered by a propeller which can be seen when the real drone takes off. However, due to the usage of footage from the 2007 Transformers movie, when the CGI drone approaches the battlefield, the propeller is absent, replaced by a jet engine. Also unfortunate is the fact the real drone with the propeller is white, while the CGI drone is black. This is one that I'm sure almost all of you have noticed, but when Ravage starts ravaging Bumblebee's like back, some of the back cable's gone, but when we see him on the next shot, the back cable's magically back. You see guys, it, this is reinforcing the fact that Bumblebee always had his ability from the last night. Michael Bay didn't make that up out of nowhere, he always like subtly implied that in the background. Maybe Michael Bay is smarter than we think, maybe Michael Bay is Scott Cotton, maybe he planned things in advance like way ahead of time. He was some kind of mad genius with five Transformers movies in mind. I remember that this is something that Trans Theory mentioned in one of his videos um, where Ironhide lost his cannons in Egypt, you know, in that scene where he's running to escape the bombardment and he drops them. Well, in the next scene he has it back. So maybe that never really did happen and Ironhide could always get his cannons back through magic. Alright, this is one that really, really bothers me, but when Ness and the American soldiers fight the Decepticons, they use weapons like assault rifles, machine guns, sniper rifles, small caliber arms, and these are able to um, injure the Decepticons and do, you know, moderate damage, I guess. When in the previous movie, it was really well established that only, you know, high heat weapons, Sabbath rounds, were even capable of penetrating the Decepticon armor. Even if they somehow figure out how to make a small caliber ammunition achieve the high heat required to damage the Decepticon armor, it is extremely unlikely that such low power weapons will do any meaningful damage that warrants such widespread usage. After all, in real life, you can kill a tank with a machine gun. But to not be totally unfair to Michael Bay, this does get explained in Dark of the Moon where they explain that small arms fire, hitting the Decepticon armor scrambles their circuits and disorients them. So it's an error and at the same time not an error really, it's depending on how you want to see it. The notion that a big metal box containing a tiny Cybertronian person inside will ever make it through the post 9-11 airport luggage screening is a bit on the implausible side of things. Ironically, the novel kind of remedied this inconsistency by implying that it was Michaela's epic hotness that distracted the guards long enough for them to sneak Willy inside. She also claimed that the box contained expensive mechanic tools, which might look strange in an x-ray. Which is actually kind of smart, you know, one of Michaela's smartest moments. When Alex attacks Sam and his friends, the box Wheelie is imprisoned in is not seen when Michaela and Leo escape from the foundry in Bumblebee. The box should still have been inside the wreckage of the car, but Willy nonetheless continues to appear in the film despite there being no indication that anyone returned to the foundry after the battle. So let me get this straight. The Allspark was used to kill Megatron. Yeah, we, right, okay, he can do that. Optimus said he can do that. But he can also be used to revive him when he killed him before. Why? Now this might be a nitpick from a continuity standpoint, but Remember that um, Megatron is not buried alone in um, Revenge of the Fallen. He's buried with Blackout and Brawl and Bone Crusher and probably Frenzy and Jazz. So the Decepticons have plenty, plenty of parts they can use to fix Megatron up, you know? So they don't really need to kill one of their own to do so. 
And don't get me started with, oh, maybe the parts were unusable. Well, not enough time has passed for the parts to become unusable since Megatron's body itself is pretty intact. So they're clearly in fine condition out there. And it's not like, you know, they need a living donor, you know, someone who's recently alive. Because, I mean, they do end up killing the little guy first before, you know, transferring the parts. So, you know, it counts as an error for me. Something that I never really thought about until Latia Wiggy pointed it out, but given that the other was a pyro nest and that they rely on the US Air Force for transportation around the world, um, how did no one notice that the Autobots had left to the east coast of the United States? In fact, how did they make it there without any using, you know, kind of aerial transportation to make it there? The Autobots don't have a flyer, and as soon as the Autobots tell the humans to take them to the east coast, I feel like Lennox will know right away instead of finding out, like, once the Autobots are already there. Just makes no sense! Where does Michaela get the padding and gauze to bandage up Sam's hand? They were in the middle of the desert. When Jetfire teleports to Egypt, Wheelie is seen landing by him, but disappears until the group reaches the border guards. After they arrive at the pyramids, Wheelie is seen rolling in with the quartet of humans, but it's never seen again. You know, people wonder why the twins were never seen again after that one scene with Devastator, but I don't see enough people pointing out why Wheelie was never seen again. I mean, yeah, I mean, Wheelie comes back, so I got him some slack. Another story continuity error is that uh, Sam meets plenty of Autobots while in his journey to reach Optimus Prime's corpse, like Bumblebee, Ironhide, and the RC sisters. I mean, I'm sure he could get on top of one RC sister and just, you know, scooter back at full speed to revive Optimus using the Matrix. Hell, I mean, one of the RC sisters survived, but I'm pretty sure she could do it. Hell, Bumblebee went off to score Sam's parents, why can't they all go together inside Bumblebee to Optimus Prime's corpse? Also, speaking of weird choices, why did Simmons climb the pyramid? There was no need to do so, he just needed to provide the coordinates. He didn't really need to be there to tell them, okay, shoot where I am, but a little bit ahead of me. He could have, like, been on the ground and be like, so, uh, at top of the third pyramid, a uh, giant robot, uh, shooting in that direction, coordinates are XXXX, uh, Naruto fan 666, shoot them now, and kill Devastator. It's also kind of hard to believe that he climbed the pyramid without being squashed by rocks falling down the pyramid because, I mean, there was debris coming from all four sides, not just one side, so at any point he could have died. I was actually pretty reckless. Also, um, when they're in the basement of Simon's mom, um, Willie projects laser dots onto a map of the United States to indicate where the Seekers are located. One dot hovers over Syracuse, New York, never heard of it, and I live in this life forsaken place. Another hovers over Trenton, New Jersey. Yet Simmons inexplicably says that the closest one to their current location is Washington, and there is no dot over Washington. When Jetfire is activated at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum, he leaves the exhibition center and exits into the desert location on the 309 Aerospace Maintenance and Regeneration Group, which is in Tucson, Arizona. When Jetfire breaks out of the building, we can see a composited image of the Bonjour's rows of planes. So it's arguably that in this universe, the middle of Washington DC happens to be a desert full of old planes and no buildings. And you get the point. They, they, they went from a city to a desert graveyard for airplanes? And what's funny is that Michael Bay tries to excuse this error by saying that in, in his uh, movie audio commentary that uh, most people in Taiwan will probably never notice this error. Yeah, but Michael Bay, these movies are explicitly made for American audiences. You, you showcase the American flag loud and proud in every movie. What does the people of Taiwan have to do with this? Optimus, Megatron, Starscream, and the Fallen take their fight from the pyramids of Giza to the Temple of Luxor, which is more than 300 miles away. They're not really, you know, close to one another, they're actually, like, really far away. So the notion that they went from this to this in the span of one shot is ridiculous. Something I always found really weird about the final fight in Egypt is that we're all the civilians. I know there's like people living there, you know, we see a few houses and stuff, but the Pyramid of Giza and some of like the other attractions that the Autobots NS, you know, go to. Where are all the citizens? The tourists? You know, those are very popular spots. We're not talking about like some random place that nobody knows about, like Batman. That's an actual city, by the way. So unlike the first movie where my complaint was that people reacted very weirdly to, um, 
the Autobots and Decepticons, you know, who were trashing the city and didn't seem to react until they were right in front of them. For this movie, it's actually that there was no one there to react to anything. <laughs> There should at least be one person in in each one of those places. And the last mistake, and this is a geographical mistake, um, the movie gives the impression that the Pyramid of Giza is located near to the coast, since the soldiers and tanks deployed from hovercraft arrive at the battle site almost immediately. But in reality, the closest seashore, the tip of the Red Sea, is still over 70 miles away from the pyramid. Worse, when the railgun is fired, a monitor screen on the board of the USS Kidd the axe and actual name for a ship shows footage of the pyramid with the ocean in the foreground, making it appear like they're more than a mile or two away from the shore. Worse still, this is immediately followed by a shot of the pyramid that shows nothing but desert in the direction of the railgun shot is coming from. So where is the ocean in this scene? Where's the desert? The pyramids are not near the ocean. I know, I know Americans are bad at geography, but this is absurd. Egypt is famous for its desert. How do you mistake deserts with oceans? But yeah guys, those are all the errors from the Transformers Revenge of the Fallen movie. Now there are a bit more uh, geographical errors. For example, um, for example, when you follow Sam in his college, uh, we get an aerial view of Price Dome University and it's immediately followed by a ground shot of the dormitories at the University of Pennsylvania. You know, not the same place, but it's one of those errors that don't really matter and are not that fun to mention, so I omitted them. But these are the most notable ones and the ones people will actually kind of care about. <laughs> it's fun seeing some of these errors repeat in every movie, like the license plates, the disappearing characters, the weird geographical inconsistencies. But hey, unlike the last movie, at least there wasn't any like weird changes in time this time. Well, there was, but like very minor, so it doesn't really matter. So, random applause for fixing that. Like, that was the one thing ruined the movies, not the lack of robot screen time, the overuse of the American military, nah, it was the random timing consistency. Michael Bay, you did it, take my money. But yeah guys, that's the end of this video, um, next up I will be doing Dark of the Moon, then Age of Extinction, then The Last Night, and then the BV movie, and after that I might move on to covering errors from shows and stuff like that, or I might just revisit the previous movies and, you know, cover some of the errors I didn't originally cover. We'll see. You guys really do seem to like this series and I'm really happy for that because I have a lot of fun doing these, and some people have gone in my previous video saying that you shouldn't be talking about errors, they ruined the movies. You're ruining the movies, you, you, you know, it's bad. It's just gonna make the pe people, it's gonna make people like the movies less. And to that I have to say, I don't care and I think that's stupid. Um, you should be able to criticize something that you like. Like I say, I like the movies, like despite its many flaws. Like at the beginning of the video, people don't watch all the way through. I say, I state very clearly. I like the movies, they're flawed, but I can have fun watching them, and I want to point out it's many, many flaws. Because no film is perfect and the Transformers movies are certainly not even close to perfect. So that's why I do it, and I won't stop. If if this series doesn't make you dislike the movies any more or any less, then again, that's your problem, that's your problem, that's up to you. I'm not here to tell you, oh, look at these errors, this movie sucks! No, errors happen in every movie, every movie has them, and you know, um... If you're bothered by it, then I'm sorry, but these are actually things that happen in the film. I really don't know what to tell you, man. But yeah, let me know if any mistakes I might have missed, because I most certainly missed some stuff here and there. And which one of these errors did you previously not know about and now know? So let me know all about it in the comments down below. Anyways guys, that's it for this video. Hopefully you all enjoy. Like, comment, and subscribe. And I'll be seeing you guys in the next video. Stay safe, guys.